Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our weekly briefing. Uh, today, we'll be hearing from public health, as usual, the streets division, uh, and then our engineering division as well. A couple of things just to top off the briefing with. Um, I just want to remind folks that it is Women's History Month. Uh, the city is acknowledging this in a number of ways. I encourage you to follow our engineering division to learn more about women in construction. Our water utility has also been celebrating the women of the Madison Water Utility, uh, as, her, as has our Women's Issues Committee been uh, celebrating their work. And as always, our fantastic libraries have great resources for reading and education. Um, on Women's History Month and just about anything else that you could want. So I encourage you to, to check that out. A um, few other things coming up. Uh, I did not know this, but apparently March 20th, in addition to being the spring equinox, is the International Day of Happiness. Um, it is also then on March 21st, the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. I'm going to suggest that we flip the two because I'm pretty sure we can't have the first without the second. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead to the public health briefing and hear from Janelle Heinrich, who's the director of public health, Madison, Dane County. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, everyone. Um, as usual, I'll start with some data. Since the beginning of the pandemic, 41,327 individuals have been diagnosed with COVID-19 in Dane County, but with only 311 individuals being diagnosed in the past week. Our 14-day average is 57.1 cases per day, down from 61.2 last week. Percent positivity is under 1%, and hospitalizations are stable right now. There are 35, 20, excuse me, there are 25 people hospitalized with COVID in Dane County. Today, we released an amendment to order number 14 that adjusts some face covering and distancing requirements for people who are fully vaccinated. Based on guidance from both the CDC and the Wisconsin Department of Health Services, order number 14 has been amended and the amendment goes into effect today. This amendment states that fully vaccinated individuals do not need to maintain six feet of physical distancing or wear a face covering when in an enclosed space where all individuals in the enclosed space are fully vaccinated. Fully vaccinated individuals do not need to maintain six feet of physical distancing or wear a face covering when in an enclosed space with individuals from a single household who are, fully vaccinate, who are not fully vaccinated and who are not at an increased risk for severe COVID disease as, de as defined by the CDC. People are considered fully vaccinated for COVID when it has been at least two weeks after they have received the second dose in a two-dose series, which is the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine, or at least two weeks after they have received a single-dose vaccine, and right now that's the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Fully vaccinated individuals must continue to follow all other aspects of the order, and no other changes have been made to the current order. As people consider what this change means for them, I want to remind you that just because a certain group of people are eligible for a vaccine, it does not mean they are vaccinated. Have conversations with your friends and loved ones about their vaccination status before ditching your masks when you gather together privately. I'm happy to have this clear and updated guidance from the CDC and the State Department of Health Services that outlines what fully vaccinated people can do safely. This is another way that we are continuing to our return to normal. I encourage you to please get vaccinated when you are eligible, but to remain patient because even though vaccine supply is increasing, demand is still outpacing that supply. On the matter of vaccine, as of yesterday, March 17th, 146,670 people in Dane County have received at least one dose of vaccine. This is 26.8% of our total population. 85,438 individuals have completed the vaccine, vaccine series, which is 16.8% of our total population. You can learn more about those who have been vaccinated on the Wisconsin Department, Department of Health Services website 
on their dashboard, which is linked on our dashboard. There are many people who are currently eligible for a vaccine and even more who are going to become eligible on March 22nd. Please visit our website and for details on eligibility and finding vaccine at www.publichealthmdc.com. And then we have a red bar on the top that talks about vaccine. We are currently transitioning from using our own signup to using the Wisconsin Department of Health Services Wisconsin COVID-19 vaccine registry. If you register with the state registry, we will be receiving your data. If you're newly eligible on March 22nd, you might have to wait until Monday to sign up as the state has not finished adding all of the newly eligible medical conditions to their form. You can find the link to their form on the vaccine page of our website. Until we're all fully vaccinated, please continue to follow the public health measures that have helped get us out, get us to this place of hope. Continue to wear a mask, maintain physical distance from others, gather outside, avoid crowded spaces, and be thoughtful about the activities you engage in. The more ways you can reduce your risk, the better you are protecting yourself and your loved ones. Thank you and stay well. Thank you, Janelle. That's great news on the vaccination front. I just want to reinforce uh, that the way out of all of this is for us to continue to follow the public health recommendations and orders until we can get vaccinated. So keep on masking and washing your hands. Um, and when you are eligible, please do go and get that vaccine. Next, we are going to hear from Brian Johnson, who is our Streets Division Recycling and Public Education Coordinator, to talk about our new Master Recycler program. Brian? Hello. So the first thing I want to do is give you a number. 18.9% of what we put into our recycling today is trash. Or in other words, 18.9% 18 of what you put on that recycling cart doesn't belong there. It's just garbage. It has no business being in that cart. So for 2020, that means we put about 3,400 tons worth of stuff in our recycling every other week that should not have been there. And we can do better than that here in, in Madison. We are one of we are probably the oldest municipal recycling program in the country. We started in 1968. We've, this is in our blood at this point, so we can be better. So one of the ways we can try to help steer this train to get that contamination number down to make certain we're recycling more, but also recycling right, which is just as important, is that we partnered with Sustain Dane to offer a master recycler course, is what we're calling it. It's modeled off what UW Extension has done with their master gardener and master composter classes where we're going to train up a cohort of people and so they can go back to their communities to be able to share this recycling information around because there are so many small micro digital communities out there that we try to make the, the streets division, we make our recycling information as available as we can, but we still can't quite reach everybody. And that's what we hope these master recyclers can help us do to get more and more people informed about what they can and can't recycle and make certain they do it that right way. Now with the... So it is a Sustained Dane program, so to sign up for it, go to sustainedane.org. And if you go to their programs at the top, you can find the Master Recycler option. There are two classes that um, you can choose for. You can either sign up for the April sessions. Each session is two classes. You have to attend both to be a Master Recycler. There's one in April that's April 7th and 14th. And then there's the second session is July 13th and July 20th. And... Um, and yeah, you can sign up on there, and then as part of being in the Master Recycler program, you um, have to complete an outreach program to teach this to either people you go to church with, people you work with, other friends and family in your community that really help us out with this. That's it. Thank you, Brian. I admit that I am guilty of wish cycling, uh, so I'm probably contributing to that 18%. My apologies. I'll try and do better. Uh, but this is a great program, a great opportunity um, if you're passionate about recycling like I am um, to really understand what is 
uh, but does belong in the bin here in Madison and to help your friends and neighbors do that as well. So I want to thank Brian and Sustain Dane for putting this together. It's a great step forward for us um, to do even better on recycling um, here in Madison. All right, next we're going to hear about a program that is near and dear to my heart. Um, and so I'm going to bring up Stephen King, uh, who is in our engineering division, to talk about the Green Power Program. Thank you, Mayor, for the opportunity to come in and talk about this today. It is a program that is also near and dear to our hearts. Um, so this is one that we're very excited about. And I've got just a couple of pictures and slides today because uh, this is quite a photogenic program. It, it takes some good pictures. So um, uh, Green Power Plus is moving towards moving Madison towards 100% renewable energy. Um, so the Green Power Program, what is it? Uh, it's a program where the city hires inexperienced trainees from a wide variety of backgrounds to come and work with our licensed electricians in our facilities maintenance group. Um, and they all work together for the summer and they learn and develop skills and uh, install upgrades at city facilities and gain those job skills and training uh, along the way. So the goals of the program, it's kind of a win-win for everyone involved. Um, we increase the city's generation of renewable energy. We decrease the city's carbon footprint we provide job training opportunities, and we expose participants to career opportunities in renewable energy. Um, so this is kind of a, a look back at where we come from. And the program started in uh, 2016. The results from 2016 through 2020, um, we've installed 15 different systems around the city. Uh, it's everywhere from some very small systems at a city uh, water utility well that helps pump water all the way up through a very large system in Madison Metro, which is helping to charge electric buses, um, kind of everything in between. Over the uh, duration of the program, we've decreased our install cost from $4.50 a watt in 2016 when we started, down to $1.70 a watt in 2020 last year, which was, uh, you know, it's very industry competitive. Uh, we're very proud that we've been able to bring those down. Um, over the course of that program, 15 trainees have completed it. 73% of whom are persons of color and 33% are female. So one of the things that we've done with this program is we've used, used it as an opportunity to almost grow our own staff. Um, there's a shortage of skilled trades workers in the world and especially when construction is booming, those folks are um, you know, very busy and making quite a good wage in the trades. It can be tough for us to compete so um, you know, an opportunity to grab bright people and bring them in and train them uh, for the needs that we have has been very, very helpful. Um, so in, in 20, I believe it was 2018, we created two trainee positions to move people from our hourly program into permanent positions in our facilities maintenance group. It resulted in the first woman and the first person of color on that team, and both are excellent employees and they'll be here long term, we hope. Um, so where are we going from here? Uh, this is actually kind of timely. Uh, our Green Power team for this year starts on Monday, so we're all very excited. Um, this year we're looking to expand the Grow Our Own strategy, uh, looking to formalize what we're doing. Um, we're working with human resources to develop a, a very defined competitive pathway from these hourly positions through LTE positions at the city up to permanent employment um, to further help us build and diversify our, our workforce. And the thought is that it can benefit engineering, but also benefit other city departments. Um, you know, there are many groups in the city that need skilled trades workers, uh, and we're hoping to work with any or all of them on this program. Um, so what are we doing this year? Um, like I said, the class starts on Monday. We have three new trainees coming on board, in addition to one coming over from last year. Um, this year, for the first time, we'll have two crews. Uh, each crew is led by uh, a licensed electrician. Um, so we'll have two crews out in the field doing our projects. Um, and we have a number of those. We'll be doing a pull mount system at Fire Station 7 and West Police over by Elver Park. And we'll be doing roof mount systems at Fire Station 14 and further expanding the large system already at Metro. We're also going to be doing an off-grid battery-based electric vehicle charging system uh, at Emil Street, our engineering operations facility, um, as well as three big lighting retrofit projects at our police stations, east and west, as well as the training facility. 
So looking forward, we're just hoping to continue doing a lot of the things that we're already doing. Um, finding great people, giving them great training, uh, identifying the projects which are most effective to do in-house versus contracting out, and accelerating all of the lighting and PV installs that we're doing. So thank you, Mayor, for the opportunity to be here, and uh, we're excited about this program. Thank you, Stephen. It's such a great program, and you know when we talk about um, at the national level, when we talk about green jobs, this is what we're talking about, right? This is these are green jobs. It's an excellent opportunity for people to get trained up in certainly in solar installation, uh, but also as you see in in LED technology um, and. Uh, the basic skills that you need to be successful in the trades um, and to go on to a good uh, family supporting career, um, whether that's here at the city, which I certainly hope it is, um, or somewhere else. So I want to just really thank everybody in engineering who's worked on this and made it possible to expand this program. Um, and to all of our Green Power trainees, past and present, we're delighted to have you on Team City and looking forward to great things. All right, I have a, a number uh, of things to go over today as well, but I want to start by acknowledging uh, what happened in the Atlanta area and the tragedy there. Uh, we have seen that anti-Asian uh, harassment and uh, misogyny and violence against women have soared in the United States since the onset of COVID-19. Um, and, you know, it's this is in part because really inappropriate and racist comments uh, by political leaders have fanned the flames. And we are dealing with the fallout of that. City of Madison does not tolerate harassment, hate speech, or acts of violence uh, against protected groups. And as a city, we work every day to ensure that Madison is a welcoming and safe community for everyone. We have several resources that for any who may be suffering uh, race-based race harassment in our community. So if you are a victim of discrimination or harassment or a hate crime anywhere in the city of Madison, please contact our civil rights division at 608-266-4910 or dcr at cityofmadison.com. Of course, if you are in imminent danger, please call 911 um, and make sure that you are safe. Uh, but we do really encourage people to report discrimination, harassment, and hate crimes uh, to the Department of Civil Rights. The pain that is brought on by hate crimes and discrimination not only impacts our Asian neighbors, but also makes our whole community weaker in a time when we need to be strong as a community and we need each other more than ever. I stand in solidarity with the Asian and Asian American community um, here in Madison and across the country. And I wish everyone who's been impacted by the events in Atlanta and beyond healing and safety in these difficult times. Right. I also want to take a moment to thank Governor Evers uh, for the sustainability measures that are in his budget. Um, he has really taken long needed action on climate change. I just want to highlight a few things um, and an opportunity for you all. The um, budget introduced by the governor creates an office of environmental justice, which is very much needed. It expands the focus on energy program. It provides funding for flooding and resilience initiatives, provides funding for electric vehicle charging infrastructure, um, and many other things that would really advance our work uh, here in Wisconsin on climate change. I really appreciate the governor's uh, putting this support and assistance for local communities into his budget. Uh, it also would provide funding for tree planting, efficiency, finance programs, um, and support for planning around climate change. We know that climate change is a global issue, but the impacts are all felt locally, and we are intimately familiar with that here in Madison. The damage from flooding and heat-related health impacts are all issues that we have to anticipate and address locally, and they will affect our infrastructure, our budgets, and our community well-being. Uh, so I'm really glad to have a partner 
at the state uh, who cares about this and is willing to, um, to fund this work in his budget. If you want to learn more and get involved, there are uh, budget listening sessions um, and they are called Badger Bounce Back Live Sessions. They focus on different sections of the budget um, and they will be streamed on the governor's YouTube page. So I encourage you to check those out. All right, I know I sound a little bit like a broken record about this, but it is election season again. Um, we have an upcoming election on April 6th and um, we now have our secure ballot drop boxes open. Um, these ballot drop boxes provide a way for anyone who has been issued an absentee ballot to return their ballot to the city clerk's office. So you should, if you've requested an absentee ballot already for the April 6th election, you should see it in your mailbox. You should have it already or it will be coming in the next few days. Uh, please follow the instructions included with your ballot to make sure that you fill it out properly, get it witnessed, um, and that your ballot will be counted. Once you vote your ballot and seal it in the completed certificate envelope, you can drop it off in the secure drop box that is closest to you. Those drop boxes are at every fire station except one, uh, and that one is in Elver Park instead of at the fire station. Uh, you also have the option, obviously, to return your ballot by mail or to drop it off in person at the city clerk's office. Um, you can also, if you have not um, gotten a ballot, requested an absentee ballot, you can vote early absentee uh, starting on March 23rd or obviously at your polling place on election day. I encourage you um, to make sure that you're registered um, and to make sure that you have a plan to vote in the April 6th election. Um, there are a number of important things on the ballot uh, in this election, including the statewide election for the uh, superintendent of schools um, and a number of uh, county board races. And then in Madison, every city council race uh, is on the ballot and there are two school board races as well as a number of judges. Also on the ballot um, is uh, four advisory referendum questions about the size of the Madison Common Council, the amount of older person pay, the length of older person's terms and whether or not older people should be subject to term limits. The council is asking these questions now as part of a multi-year city initiative to investigate whether changes to the structure of our government could improve representation and engagement for all of Madison's residents, including people of color and those living with low incomes. The referenda are advisory only. Um, it will not bind the city to make any immediate changes. Instead, we will use this information to gauge residents' interest in pursuing these possible changes, including a possible binding referendum in the spring of 22. And if implemented, any changes would take effect in the spring of 23. So again, there are four questions that will appear on your ballot. The first question um, is whether or not the city should transition to a full-time council uh, with each common council member earning between 50 and 80% of the adjusted media income for Dane County. The second question is whether um, starting in uh, 2023, the size of the council should be reduced, be increased, or stay the same at 20. The third question is whether uh, the council members should be elected to four-year terms instead of two-year terms. And then the fourth question is whether uh, council members should be subject to a term limit of 12 consecutive years. These are big questions for the future of our city. I encourage you to think about them, uh, to talk with your friends and neighbors. You can learn more. There's an episode of District Reports um, that is available on the award-winning Madison City Channel website that you can watch. Um, there's also a report from the Task Force on the Structure of City Government um, that uh, you can find linked off of the council website or the a media release on this issue. I really encourage people to, to read up and uh, think about these issues so that you can make an informed decision on the four advisory referenda that will be on your ballot this spring. And again, really encourage everybody to vote. 
All right, we have a number of public works related announcements that I'll go through quickly. First of all, uh, just wanna let folks know that the city's sandbag locations are stocked and ready ahead of the spring rains. We do this every year. Um, we don't have uh, any particular indication that we have a risk, high risk of flooding this year. We think it's the risk of flooding is average this year, but we like to be prepared. Um, and so uh, you can, if you are concerned um, or want to access the sandbags, please bring a shovel. The bags and sand are provided um, for city residents, not for contractors uh, at the following locations from now until late October. Those locations are the engineering service building on Emil Street, um, the Ulbrick Park boat launch parking lot on Atwood, the Olin Park parking lot on Olin Turville, uh, Spring Harbor Park parking lot at Lake Mendota Drive, Tenney Park Beach on Sherman, Foot Park on Nana Way, and then a Warner Park Beach parking lot on Woodward Drive. So hopefully nobody will need sandbags, but if you do, uh, they're there for you. Uh, a couple of announcements from our parking division. Um, we're taking another step towards uh, normalcy um, in that the parking division is uh, rolling back the temporary parking rate reductions in our city-owned parking garages. Um, so we're incrementally moving back towards our standard parking rates. Um, we are discontinuing um, the Saturday first hour of parking free program. Um, we are uh, also discontinuing the temporary max daily rate of $8. We'll go back to our standard rates on Saturdays um, and on weekdays. Um, we do, uh, we are bringing back a nights and weekend maximum rate um, at $5. So on weekends, um, each parking session between 6 p.m. and 5 a.m. Monday through Friday, it's a maximum of $5 daily rate. Um, our city owned parking garages offer a low cost long term parking option when you're parking for longer than two hours. And um, we have integrated a thorough sanitizing requirement for the safety of staff and visitors, including contact free entrance payments and exiting. Um, also from the parking division, we have a new app. I'm very excited about this. I've been missing the parking app. Um, so we have a, um, the staff have been um, removing and replacing nearly all of our on-street pay stations and number markers with new IPS single space smart meters. Um, these solar pilot meters allow greater variety of payment options, accepting coins, Visa and MasterCard. And we're rolling out a map to replace the Mobile Now app that went out of business due to the pandemic. So our new app is called Park Smarter. Um, it's available for most of your mobile smart devices. It allows for contactless parking uh, for all of our on-street parking meters. Um, it's also usable at some of our off-street meters as well, including the motorcycle meters in garages. Hopefully easy to use, uh, lots of shiny features. Encourage you to download it and check it out uh, if you uh, use our on-street parking um, meter system. Uh, and of course, you can find out more uh, at the Parking Utilities website. Also want to let you know that our Wilson Street Garage did reopen on the 16th. I'm glad to have that back in service. And starting today, the expanded access for monthly parking permits at alternate locations will conclude. Um, tomorrow, March 19th, your access card will only allow you entrance and exit of the Wilson Street Garage if you have uh, one of those monthly parking permits. Also want to let you know, uh, related to parking, that on Monday, March 22nd, um, starting at 5 a.m. till approximately 8 p.m. on Thursday, March 25th, we'll be closing the 10 block of East Doty Street to remove the tower crane for the Judge Doyle Square construction site. Um, so that means that access to the block 89 parking garage uh, will be via two-way converted traffic from Martin Luther King uh, on Doty um, and will convert that intersection to an all-way stop. And also access to our Wilson Street parking garage will um, be 
only on the East, William Street, well, East Wilson Street driveway. So uh, you won't be able to enter through Doty. Um, we will maintain pedestrian access through the block. All right, finally, as I always do, I wanna run through some community resources that are available to folks uh, who need them. And I just wanna note all of these are linked on our um, page, our homepage, cityofmadison.com. You click on the community resources link. There's a lot of information there. If you need uh, help uh, maintaining your housing or finding housing, you can call our housing helpline at 608-264-0549 or email housinginfo at cityofmadison.com. Uh, if you need help accessing phone service or internet service, call the State Public Service Commission at 608-267-3595. If you need help finding a child care provider, call 608-216-7022. Uh, for help with all of these things, plus emergency food options, should you need them, plus many more social services, you can call United Way of Dane County at 211 or text your zip code to 898-211. The city offers a free financial navigation resource to folks who have been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The website for that is cityofmadison.com slash financial hotline or you can call our library line at 608-315-5151 and they will get you signed up for a session. The uh, healthcare.gov um, health insurance marketplace is open through May 15th. If you do not have health insurance, please get covered uh, through healthcare.gov. If you need assistance navigating the website Covering Wisconsin will help you with that. You can visit wiscovered.com or call 211. If you need assistance paying your health care premiums uh, through the exchange, through the marketplace, um, the Health Connect program um, can help you. Again, you can call 211 or you can visit unitedwaydanecounty.org slash healthconnect to get more information. And if you need access to a computer or the internet in order to uh, sign up for any of these things or find out more information, just want to remind folks that our libraries um, are offering appointments for computer access, um, uh, even though they are closed to the general public for the moment. And you can call our library line 608-315-5151 for more information um, or to make an appointment to use a computer. I uh, also encourage people to visit and subscribe to my blog at cityofmadison.com slash mayor slash blog for information about all of this and so much more uh, for your reading pleasure. Finally, upcoming meetings. Today at 4, the Monona Terrace Community and Convention Center Board will meet. Uh, at 5, the Traffic Calming Subcommittee will meet. Also at 5, Zoning Board of Appeals. Also at 5, Landlord and Tenant Issues Committee. Also at 5, Police Civilian Oversight Board. And also at 5, Digital Technology Committee. You have some hard choices to make for your 5 o'clock hour. Um, and at 5.30 today, the Downtown Courting Committee will meet. On Friday the 19th uh, at noon, the Police and Fire Commission will meet. On Monday, the 22nd, at 4.30, the Finance Committee meets. And at 5.30, the Plan Commission meets. Tuesday, the 23rd, at 4.30, the Water Utility Board will meet. And Wednesday, the 24th, at 2.30, the Committee on Aging will meet. And at 5, the Transportation Commission will meet. And that is what I have for this week. Linda, do we have questions? Indeed, we do. We have some questions for uh, the public health director. All right. We'll bring Janelle back up. Good morning, Janelle. Good morning. We have a couple of questions for you. All right. Um, the first is, what is the city, county doing to ensure that vulnerable neighborhoods have access to COVID-19 vaccine? Is Madison targeting specific zip codes or communities like Milwaukee is? Yeah, thank you for that question. This is a very important um, component of our uh, vaccine 
um, implementation, um, uh, administration, and outreach plan. Uh, we have, for a number of months now, been working with community partners and healthcare partners to um, make information around vaccine accessible uh, by doing a number of um, events, town halls, webinars with folks um, in order to support um, building understanding of the importance of the vaccine and to undo some myths around it. Um, and there's an incredible effort with healthcare partners to uh, make vaccine accessible. And we hope uh, to very shortly start uh, providing mobile clinics um, to different communities around Dane County, uh, specifically those who may have uh, different outcomes, uh, unfortunate outcomes around um, health outcomes, as well as um, where transportation may be challenged. Thank you. Um, the other question we have for you today is, Milwaukee County eased restrictions for professional sports teams that aren't in place for the rest of the community. Wondering if public health is in talks with Madison Forward or Madison Mallards about whether they can play games in Dane County this year. Sure, yeah. So game playing is allowed under the current order and gatherings of up to 500 are outside are supported and we only hope that that will increase as we've indicated in our forward game plan as more um, vaccine coverage comes on board and we continue to see decreasing rates of COVID activity. Okay, thank you so much. All right, thank you, Janelle. I just want to end uh, with letting folks know that March 22nd is World Water Day. Um, so encourage you to appreciate our water resources here in Madison on the 22nd and of course every day, um, our beautiful lakes and rivers and streams but also encourage you to appreciate the folks that are responsible for bringing clean water to our taps every day at the fantastic Madison Water Utility. And so that's it for this week. We'll see you next week. Thank you all very much.